I'm one of the urology staff at um, the Naval Hospital in Portsmouth, Virginia. Work with or former resident and fellow with um, Dr. McCammon, um, who had you know, asked me to give a, a lecture on some of the basics and fundamentals of urologic research. So, um, you know, it was a little bit challenging to put the lecture together just because I didn't know exactly everybody's background and how much experience that you have with um, doing, you know, uh, urologic research. So if it's too basic, I apologize. Um, also, if any questions come up, you know, during the slides, feel free just to holler and I can stop and we can, you know, have a discussion about that. But otherwise, I'll kind of just um, flow through the slides here. Assuming I can figure out how to advance it. And here we go. Let me just minimize myself here. <clears throat> so just a few objectives. So I'll try and give a, you know, a, a talk about research without putting everybody to sleep, which sometimes is easier said than done. Um, talk a bit about why to do research, how to get started, some on design, research designs, stats, um, the institutional review board or whichever local um, similar um, entity is in your country. And then um, last finish up about, um, you know, doing presentations at meetings and then um, publication, some tips for doing those things. It's not working. Let's see. So always got to start with a comic strip. Just a, um, this is just talking about a, a, a guy doing some research or, or failing to do some research and his mentor had given him a hard time, which um, sounds like a lot of my experience uh, working with Dr. McCammon over the years. So first, why, why to do research at all other than, you know, advancing the field. But um, I, you know, hear a lot from residents and trainees you know, does doing research, you know, positively or negatively impact their training and then their future careers. Um, so I pulled up a few studies uh, dealing with this. This is a, a, a paper out of Mayo Clinic looking at Mayo residents that were followed through their residency. And what they found was that the increased number of publications actually led to higher performance evaluations um, during their residency. And then also no difference in terms of standardized test taking throughout the course of their training. So um, doing, res doing research during training uh, for, for yourself, if you're a trainee or for your trainees um, will actually help the trainee as opposed to hurt the trainee in the long run. So that's good to know. And then research definitely helps applying to you know, subspecialization and fellowship training, which I know matters to a lot of people. This is a, a survey of um, applicants to a pediatric surgery program. <clears throat> Match rate was only 50% amongst the respondents. And if you see the, the applicants that had more research publications had a much higher match rate. So the um, average publications for those who matched versus didn't was um, nearly 10 publications versus five. So just as some, um, you know, barometer. The research experience between the matched and the unmatched candidates was actually similar, which suggests that if you're, you know, one rationale for doing research is to help with, you know, uh, fellowship training and residency training. And so it's important to follow pro projects through all the way to the end rather than just start a project. You need to actually finish it and get it published to have it be helpful for um, career advancement. <clears throat> and then this last paper looked at applicants in the 2015 uh, um, application to a surgical oncology fellowship, um, similar to the last um, um, paper that I mentioned. There's a fairly low match rate, but the, of those people who matched, they had higher publication rates. And they were also more frequently published in, oops, excuse me, in journals um, with a higher uh, impact score. So more, you know, prestigious type journals. So, <clears throat> Those are some of the obvious benefits, help career advancement, help get into fellowships, help um, you know, get into residencies and that sort of thing. You know, other benefits, um, not just, you know, research is not just for um, academic uh, urologists, it's also for, you know, urologists just out in um, private practice or out in the community. Employer, employers definitely take notice. Um, I've had multiple patients who have found research that I've published over the years that bring it up when I'm speaking with them in clinic. So they definitely appreciate the fact that you're out there doing the projects and creating the science. 
Um, and then definitely meeting colleagues to collaborate with is uh, is exciting and fun and you know traveling to meetings. So just some sort of benefits and why to get into research in the first place. So then, you know, once you've made the decision to do it, how do you do it? Um, the what I find is the best way to sort of come up with a, a research project is to have a question that you're not able to answer based on the existing literature. So, you know, some sort of a clinical question um, is the ideal place to start. Doesn't always it's not always that easy, but uh, if you can, that's the that's the best. Um, <clears throat> other options, you know, speak with uh, fellow residents, fellows, uh, attendings that have projects going on that uh, might have uh, insight into, um, you know, a, a type of project that would be good for you. Um, or, you know, help out a colleague who's um, has a, an ongoing project and needs some help with the work. So just some areas or ideas to sort of how to get, just take that first step in terms of coming up with a project. Um, there's definitely some pitfalls to keep in mind, um, especially for trainees. So um, there's plenty of stories about sort of never ending research projects. These would be examples of like, a, a, you know, a, say a renal mass database or something like that. Some sort of ongoing data gathering type project that never seems to end. So I'm always, I always um, warn people who are getting into research uh, projects to make sure they can see the end of the project. You don't want to do a lot of work on a, on a research project that never goes anywhere. Um, so keep that in mind. You know, keep in mind how much work you're going to put in versus the likelihood of, uh, you know, good science coming out the other side and publications associated with it. You want to make sure you're uh, rewarded for the work that you put in. And then lastly, before you get started on any projects, you want to know who's going to be on the paper when it gets published. So depending on how your department's laid out or the residency training program, you know, you want to avoid situations where you're the one doing all the work and then you're buried somewhere in the author list in the middle, as opposed to the beginning, you know, showing that you've um, done the bulk of the work. So make sure that's, you don't have to necessarily, you know, get the exact uh, people that would be on the paper, but get an idea that, you know, if you do a lot of work, you're going to be rewarded for doing so. So those are things to think about sort of upfront when you're getting started. So similar, you know, other considerations, how much time do you have, you know, make sure you're not taking on projects that you don't have time for. How much money do you have certain projects are free, for example, retrospective reviews that just takes your time doesn't take any money. Um, but other projects are not free and require a cost so you want to make sure you have the money for the project if um, if it's required. And then what's your goal on the other end, you know, is it uh, so you want to make sure you answer a clinical question or you just are trying to get some publications on your CV to sort of have an idea of what you're trying to accomplish. <clears throat> so I always recommend doing, you know, once you've come up with a question, for example, or an idea for a project, the next step for me is a literature search uh, for a variety of reasons. And not just a, you know, a simple Google search, but really try and do a th fairly thorough literature search early on. Um, because first you wanna make sure has the question already been answered because you really wanna avoid doing a whole project writing a manuscript, you know, trying to get it published, and then the journals that you're submitting to say this has already been answered, there's no need for this extra paper, and then it's just a waste of your time. Um, so that helps if you do the literature, literature search early. <clears throat> Definitely helps with research design. Um, you can see what's sort of already been published, how you might do it a little bit differently, how many patients or data points you might need for your, for your clinical question. Um, and then the literature search if done early will help with the rest of the research um, as you go through different aspects of it. So it'll help sort of refine your project. If there's, you know, some of the questions already been answered, but not all of it, you might change it, how you do it a little bit. Will definitely help when uh, writing the IRB approval to get uh, approval for doing the project. Um, that's a required part of that, part of the um, application process. Um, will definitely help when presenting the project at meetings so you know what's already been done and can um, you know compare and contrast your project from uh, what's already been published and then obviously uh, writing the manuscript. So all those things are helped by doing a lit search sort of early before you actually do the research. So a little bit about uh, you know research design. <clears throat> There's a ton of different options. I sort of tried to lay this out in terms of simplest to more most complex. A case report is you know something that 
here we would often have a medical student do uh, or a junior resident if they're just trying to get some their feet wet in terms of uh, research but that's super simple um, uh, project to do can be done you know in a couple of weeks um, and then sort of moving up from there literature based uh, uh, research which doesn't require any data gathering but just reviews what's already been done and combines can combine data from other studies like in a meta-analysis and then moving from there are retrospective uh, type projects whether it's just a case series like describing the data that you have or a case control series um, you know comparing two groups and then moving on to prospective uh, projects whether uh, they're observational projects or you know an intervention type project where whether it be a randomized trial or a, a placebo controlled trial type project so those are sort of um, from most simple to most complex in terms of um, project design options um, so then we get into statistics um, I'm you know I have a very personally have a very basic uh, stats background definitely not good enough to uh, know the ins and outs of all of statistics and so what I've found that's very helpful when doing a research project is to try and find a, a statistician who's good at your institution and become friends with them um, because they can really help take a lot of work off of you because they'll likely do it more efficiently and more accurately than you would do a, the stats yourself so it helps to find somebody at your institution or you know someone that you have access to that can help with doing the statistics um, before you start doing the research, once just at the very early stages, once you've got your clinical question and your idea for your research project, I recommend meeting with the statistician and talking through what you're thinking about doing and what they might recommend in terms of um, how to, you know, frame the project, how to, how much data you need to collect, you know, exact project designs, etc. Um, very helpful to meet with them early. Um, they will help do a power analysis, and depending on your uh, you know, uh, statistics background, you may or may not be familiar with that, but a power analysis helps to determine how many data points are needed to ask your question. It's always unfortunate when you do a whole research project, you make a conclusion, and then when, you know, in the process of peer review, it comes back that you didn't actually have enough power to make the statement that you were making. And so it kind of negates all the work that you put in. So it's helpful to for prospective trials come up with a power analysis ahead of time to make sure you gather enough data to answer the question that you want to answer and the statistician should be able to help with all those things and then after doing the research they'll you know everybody needs some help with data analysis and um, doing the stats and they can help do that part of it as well so <clears throat> that's always helpful to search out um, sort of early in the project and get some buy-in from the stats department um, so briefly talk about um, institutional review board approval. I'm not familiar with this, uh, the, these entities in every different country, but uh, needless to say, there likely will be some similar board um, that would, will be required to get approval from prior to doing most research, not all research, um, but practically all research. So um, case reports, for example, are institution dependent. So some places that I've been don't require uh, IRB approval, but I think most even do for a, something as simple as a case report. Literature-based projects don't require IRB approval because there's no patient data. It's just all sort of de-identified, already, already published data. But almost all research will require um, approval from an IRB type board. And then I, this is sort of from level of difficulty in terms of getting approval. You know, um, just because you want to do a project doesn't mean that it's safe to do it, or doesn't mean that uh, you know your institution is going to let you do it based on um, likelihood of harm to patients. So retrospective reviews are pretty much the easiest to get IRB approval for. Some institutions don't even re require it, but most do. Um, and then going on, prospective trials are more challenging to get approval for, and interventional trials obviously the most challenging, especially if there's potential for patient harm. So just keep that in mind when you're starting the approval process with your local review board, how long it might take. You know, retrospective approvals are pretty quick, a couple of months. A prospective trial might, you know, take you six months to get an IRB to approve it. So factor that into, you know, your timeline. <clears throat> this is, um, you know, just based on my experience dealing with um, IRB boards over the years can be very frustrating. 
Um, so I always re recommend if this is your first attempt at getting a, um, a review board to approve your project to speak with somebody in your area that um, has done it and successfully and get some, you know, words for words of wisdom from the local, um, you know, how to navigate the local system. Certain verbiage is always required um, for each sort of section in the um, in the approval. Usually there's a, a form that you have to fill out or some different sections you have to go through discussing your project. One that's universal is how you're going to protect the data. So that's important to outline, you know, very concretely how you're going to protect the data to avoid it from getting lost or stolen or, you know, um, posted on the internet or whatever. Um, consents, patient consents are um, required for most prospective trials, not all of them, but most prospective trials. And most retrospective trials do not require consent because the data is already there and you're just, um, you know, searching the medical record, for example. But um, that's something to, to keep in mind. Um, and then in terms of data collection, <clears throat> if you don't specifically list that you're going to collect a certain data point in your, in your IRB approval, you can't then collect it and publish on it. So it's important to think about these types of things before submitting your IRB so you can list every single data point that you might need on the IRB application so you're approved to use all that data when you eventually publish the trial. So it's always unfortunate, excuse me, if um, you decide, oh, there's one more piece of data that we should have collected, you wind up maybe collecting it anyways, and then when you go to publish, you can't actually use that information because it wasn't in your IRB approval. So that's something to keep in mind. The other thing is <clears throat> you want to try and limit as much of the protected health information that you collect as possible. That helps um, sort of get it through a little bit more smoothly to get your approval. So for example, one thing that I've come across over the years is rather than putting in a patient's date of birth in your data tool, data collection tool, just put their age because age is not identifiable, but date of birth is. So that, you know, you could um, still get the information you need just based on age without using their actual date of birth. So that's just one example of an area where you can reduce the amount of protected health information that you say you're going to collect from, um, um, from patients. And then in terms of the research question, so the review board always wants to know, you know, why are you doing the, what, you know, what's your question that you're trying to answer? Um, because one of their jobs is to make sure that the data that you're going to collect actually answers the question that you want to answer. Otherwise, there's no point in collecting that data. It's just, you know, uh, risk for no reward. So um, you want to be somewhat narrow and, um, you know, in the, the best quality research has a very narrow, um, you know, question that they're answering. And that's the basis of the power analysis. So that's how you get sort of the highest quality research. Um, but in terms of uh, your own work to, you know, work to the reward, you want to be a little bit more broad because you want to be able to use the same IRB approval and the same data that you collect to make multiple papers and presentations from a single submission to the review board. So there's a little bit of a balancing act there. Um, so you have to kind of decide what's the best for you and your project. Um, so I kind of mentioned this um, uh, uh, in the last slide or two, but uh, my recommendation um, for when you're writing your uh, application to the IRB for retrospective reviews, I always have a research question that's a little bit more vague that allows me to collect a lot of data points. Um, by doing that, you wind up being able to collect a lot of data and you can sort of spin off different projects from the same data set, which helps to improve your output without, you know, putting in a lot more work on the on the front side. For prospective um, projects like a randomized trial or a prospective observational study, then that would be a situation where I might have a little bit more of a crisp, um, you know, primary outcome as terms of how you're powering your study and the, the number one outcome that you're trying to answer. And then you can look at some secondary outcomes, um, you know, and, and list those also in the IRB so you can make sure you can get a couple of papers out of that one project. <clears throat> so that's it for the IRB. Um, I found depending on your institution, sometimes it's super easy. Uh, sometimes it's extremely painful. So you kind of just have to see how uh, your specific institution is and, and, and work with it. Um, so then next is, you know, talking about grants. Certain studies do need money um, unless, you're, unless your department has money free to use for you. You might have to apply for grants. 
I found that the submission process for grant applications to get money for a project is very similar to an IRB application. Um, so if you do a good literature search up front and you have your, your clinical question very clean, you have your data points that you want to collect, um, it helps immensely when you're submitting a grant application because they're going to ask you all those same questions. And so you don't have to do all the work. You've already done all that work anyways. It also helps to have the IRB already approved before submitting a grant application because they'll want to know the IRP approval number and that sort of thing. And if it's not approved yet, they might be less likely to give you the money that you're asking for. And then in terms of where to get money, um, I, you know, it's mainly just from personal experience, but um, certain training programs definitely have some research dollars if um, that might be the case for you. Certain schools, medical schools or universities sometimes have some research money that they have available that you can apply for. Definitely hospitals have a certain amount of research budget for, uh, or you know, money is set aside for a research budget. And then I've had some decent um, luck getting um, industry support, depending on what project you're doing. If you're investigating a, a drug that's new or you know, use of a certain procedure or technique at your institution, for example, industry might wanna support that if it has the potential to benefit them and you can get some money that way. Um, or government, local government um, always has some research dollars that you can apply for. In the end though, you know, there's a whole specialty for grant writing. So depending on your institution, you may have a grant writing specialist that's there. If you do, I would definitely uh, lean on them heavily for that part of the process. Let's see. <clears throat> so that's kind of a lot of the back, uh, you know, the preparation work. And then, you know, you do the research. So the, gather, gather the data and, you know, do the chart review, whatever the project might be. And then, you know, you have to, you get to reap the rewards from all the research. Um, so just a little bit about meeting presentations, um, just some in general, um, I think it's fair game to try and present your project at a couple of meetings during the year. Um, just because say you presented your research at a local, you know, uro urologic meeting, doesn't mean you can't present it at a national meeting or an international meeting. So um, as a rule, as long as this is how I sort of practice anyways, as long as it's a, in a single academic or calendar year, you can kind of continue to present in general the same or similar projects from your data. Um, that being said, once the research has pub been published, generally you can't present it then at a future meeting because the research is already out there. It's not new. Um, it's already been published. So. Um, I usually recommend you finish the research project, prepare your submission to some of your, the meetings that you think you might want to go to, and at the same time, start writing your manuscript for publication, but don't actually submit it for publication and think until you have finished, you know, presenting at whatever meetings you might want to present at. And then just in terms of, you know, style, style points for meeting presentation of your research, I always find that, you know, pictures, graphs, diagrams, are more impactful on a poster presentation or a meeting presentation than are a bunch of words on a, on a poster board. Um, so if you're thinking about things to put on, I always rely heavily on some of those graphics rather than um, just text. Um, and then in terms of types of presentations, I sort of listed them in, in terms of um, more um, prestigious quote unquote presentations. So non-moderated -moder poster presentations is sort of a catch all for presenting, not, you know, um, you don't present anything, sort of just the poster hangs up in the hall, that sort of thing. Um, then moderated posters where, uh, present, you know, a, a moderator will ask you questions, etc. And then oral presentations are sort of the highest level of presentation at meetings for your research. So that's always the goal, assuming you want to, you know, get some notoriety out there. Um, but those other categories also are helpful to build your CV and help present your research. Um, so then, you know, after doing that, it's time to draft the manuscript. Um, so I just put out some sort of general guidelines for how you might think about writing the, the manuscript to present your data for publication. Um, so introduction section is pretty, is pretty standard. What, what I usually like to put in there is what's already been published, sort of set the stage for the research that you've done and how you're going to discuss it. Um, so really just what's already been published. Then in the methods section, just talk about your study design, talk about your statistics, and then talk about the data that you actually collected. Um, so I think there's a, 
a tendency to put too much into the method section. You're really not going to talk about any of the results, not going to talk about any of the outcomes, etc. Just sort of how you design the study, why you did that, your stats, etc. Um, in the results, I, I always recommend just the facts. Try not to uh, editorialize too much. Try not to try and interpret too much. Just present the facts as you were able to achieve them in your research. And then the discussion section is really for you to, um, you know, verbalize and editorialize, explain how your results um, fit into the context of what's already been published, how you improve on what's been published, or how you're, um, you know, are consistent with or differ from what's already out there. Um, so that's the part that you can be much more liberal with you know, how you want to format it and how you want to discuss that. And then the conclusion is important. I think some people get um, get a little bit stuck in their conclusion or have trouble publishing it based specifically on the conclusion because um, they might be too concrete or too controversial. You want to make sure the conclusion to your manuscript fits the research that you've done. For example, you may have done a retrospective review of not too many patients, etc. You can't have a very definitive conclusion that sort of chain is practice changing based on that type of project compared with say a prospective placebo controlled randomized trial you can be a little bit more definitive in your conclusion so you want to try and um, you know temper the conclusion based on the data and based on what you think people will accept because sometimes um, reviewers will reject projects just because the conclusion is um, too out there and then lastly references um, you know, I've, I'm a huge fan of using um, EndNote, which is just a uh, sort of a reference managing type software. There's a, a, a bunch of similar um, programs that you might have access to at your at your institution. I would highly recommend using one of those as opposed to typing out citations that are listed at the end of the manuscript. Um, it's my experience that as you're writing the manuscript, you might um, cite certain articles, and then, for example, you might rearrange the way the paragraphs are oriented, etc. And using one of those programs helps save you a ton of time at, uh, in terms of, um, you know, reformatting the references section. It's also helpful when you decide which journal that you're submitting to. Those programs have a built-in feature. They can reformat um, your, your references section to match the criteria for that journal. So that's just a save some time uh, recommendation. If you're able, if you have access to and you're able to use one of those types of programs, I would do it. And then the last part is is submission. So, um, you know, depending on your level of uh, experience submitting articles, I recommend you know speaking with a colleague or a mentor to decide which journal might be the best to uh, submit to. You want to look at the impact factor. The higher the impact factor, the well, two things. One, the more challenging it'll be to get your article into it. Um, but if it is published in that journal, the more widespread it'll be read and cited in the future. So it's always a goal to get a higher impact factor, but you have to take into consideration the research that you've done and whether it you know, has a potential to be approved at those journals. Definitely don't get offended when it's rejected. Uh, it'll, it happens to every, everybody. It's, it's inevitable. It's always a little bit um, you know, of an uh, ego um, bruise when somebody rejects your paper, especially if they write some nasty comment about it in the review process, which is always unfortunate. Um, but do your best not to take it personally, um, as hard as that might be. Because in the end, there's a journal for every single manuscript. These days, there's thousands of journals. So if you've done a research, if you've done the research, I always recommend getting it published, even if it's a journal that somebody might not read on a regular basis. As long as it's um, you know listed and cited in PubMed, uh, you know people doing literature searches will find it, um, and so that's the important thing. Um, so there's a journal for every project; just have to find it. I think that. Okay, so fine. Well, I think this is the last slide. Um, so just just to recap, um, <clears throat> when you're when you're thinking about research projects, prospective is always better, but it takes time. So, you know, make sure you have the time to do it. But in general, prospective is always better than retrospective. You're going to get better data that way. Avoid never ending projects unless you have time to do those types of things. Um, you know, start a project on your own. Try, if you can, avoid, you know, uh, wasting a lot of time on somebody else's project that you likely won't be the lead author on, for example. Definitely do a literature search upfront, do an extensive literature search and, and you know, start to pencil in, uh, you know, write some paragraphs on how that 
comes together. It'll help you with future work on that project. Um, figure, figure out your local IRB and try not to get angry with them as they make it painful to get your project uh, up and running. Um, definitely make friends with the stats department if you have one and try and you know have some fun along the way. So I think that is the end of my slides. I'm happy to answer questions, uh, have a discussion about, about anything research related if uh, people have anything. Hi, Dr. Zuckerman Barbara. So thank you very much. I thought I was really simplified, comprehensive. So a couple of things. Um, would you be able to share the PowerPoint? I can share it with somebody juniors. I think that would be yeah, great. Yeah, sure, sure. No problem. Um, the, the next thing is, I want to ask about, you know, senior author versus first author. Because sometimes as like, I'm, you know, I'm a consultant, you'd have juniors doing research. So they, you know, obviously first author, I think is, you know, the person who's done the most work, who's all of that. I think we all understand that. But where does the senior author go in terms of, making that person you know um not getting lost in the whole list of names yeah do you think they should go at the end or they should go second what's your view on that usually the end yeah right. usually the you know usually the person who did the most work on the project goes first right uh, and then the you know the senior person on the project goes at the very end i would say there's a few cases where the senior author might want their name like cited you know for whatever reason person uh and so in few cases where senior author might want to be up front as opposed to at the very end um mm. but in most cases would be the last author in my opinion okay so the other thing is i mean like you know i'm a pediatric surgeon who does pediatric urology and pediatric surgery is such a small field we only have really limited number of journals um, and also the impact factor is very very low even the best pediatric surgery journal is it has a very low impact factor compared to you know uh, urology or general surgery or something like that what's your advice on you know publishing different journals for like people with small specialties yeah i th i mean for me i don't i try not to get too caught up in the impact factor when submitting. I mean, I'll try and submit to the highest impact factor that I think my project will get accepted to. But in mm -hmm. the end, in reality, if it's if it's uh, cited in PubMed, that's I think probably all that matters. People are still going to read your paper and still going to um, you know mm -hmm. reference it when they write future papers on that project. Um, so I mean, as far as pediatric urology and getting into higher impact factors within that subspecialty, you probably will have to look at, you know, like for example, the PED section in the Journal of Urology or a similar like European Urology, but yeah. you, know, you can still submit those articles to those journals um, and they'll just put it in that subsection of that journal. If you're looking at to find a higher impact factor for your mm -hmm. pediatric urology project. Yeah, it is a bit of a challenge. You see, the thing is, it it maybe doesn't matter to us personally, but like if you're in an institution like the university, they look at that when they're talking about promotions and all that. They don't care that your specialty is small. They look at somebody else who's publishing a high impact journal and you get a rating and, you know, your rating is very low because you're in that field, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would I would try and, you know, focus on sort of the subsections within those larger journals, probably if okay. that if that's you know a main goal what do you feel about letters to the editor in terms of you know helping your cv and things like that yeah well i mean certain certain of those things are you know uh are listed on pubmed which i think mm -hmm. is important they probably i mean they don't help as much as a, a research project would yeah obviously. i yeah. still put those things on my cv if they're not if they're um, you know, if they're published, you know, like, for example, a, uh, you know, like if you do an editorial on a on a, somebody else's project that's published in the Journal of Urology and you put your comments on it, like those things are, um, you can search those things on PubMed and they're published in the journal. So I think those are reasonable to put on a CV. They're not going to help as much as doing your research project, but I would still list them. If it's, if it's not a published thing, I wouldn't then, you know, list it. I don't think it helps that much. Yeah, I mean, I think the one thing I've learned is don't get depressed when you get you rejected. You know, you sometimes have a really, really good 
paper and you know you know there's a good message and then you have to send it two three places and then you know like get really yeah. depressed but i think that's the thing i've learned just keep trying you're gonna yeah. get it published i think the, <laughs> the hardest thing is when you put so much work into a project and then you get a reviewer who just dismisses it out of hand as like not even worth anything that's always which happens happened to me multiple times uh it's always yeah. hard to stomach that but you just you just keep moving on I, I always remember one of my one of my good friends yeah. from uh, residency in his fellowship submitted a paper for like graduation of fellowship and the it got rejected like quickly and he got very angry and wrote a nasty email to somebody which then got back to his fellowship director and then he ended up not getting a certificate for graduation so uh, <laughs> you know you gotta be those things do get around so yeah. you just take your licks and you know, yeah. move on to another journal. And move on, find another journal, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. I think there's one question in the comment section about IRB approval. Um, it says, is IRB approval submitted with the manuscript or or do you just state that it was obtained? So um, it depends on the journal that you submit to, um, but you, so you, in pretty much every project, you'll want to state that local, you know, IRB approval was obtained prior to performing the research, etc. Certain um, journals, you know, you basically can look up their journal website before you write the manuscript to make sure you're writing it in the format that they want you to write it in. And then they likely will tell you if there's a specific verbiage that they, you need to use regarding the IRB approval. Um, for their journal, you know, for when you when you list it in the manuscript, I haven't personally really had to list like the approval number or anything like that. I usually just say that the um, that institutional institutional review board approval was obtained prior to performing the research and collecting the data. Um, there's one other. So there was one other question about plagiarism. Um, so in terms of, I think if I'm reading it correctly, uh, are you asking if you present your project at a meeting, how do you avoid somebody then stealing your project and, and publishing it? Is that the question? Is, am I reading that correctly? Yes, you're reading it correctly. Okay. So I've not had that. Well, I mean, in order to publish the paper, you'd have to have the data that you're using. So certainly, if you are presenting the project at a meeting, somebody could get an idea and say, that's a really nice idea. I like the way they did that. I'm going to do something similar, which is totally fine. I mean, that happens all the time. You, um, you see the same you know, project has been published multiple times with different patients. And that's actually helpful to have multiple publications on the same topic because it sort of the consistency helps to prove that whatever you found is, you know, reproducible at another institution. So that's, well, that I wouldn't consider that sort of plagiarism more just taking somebody's idea and then replicating it at your own institution. It'd be hard for them to write a paper without doing the same research and collecting their own data because they don't have access to your data to then publish that paper. Um, I don't know if that answers the question or not. One thing, um, not, from, not exactly. Yeah, one thing I, I this might help is that you might have an idea, you might to, present a, a meeting or something, or you might have an idea and you've been working on it and somebody publishes before you, you mm -hmm. know, and it's the same thing. So you really, yeah your research then becomes, you know, you know, yeah. not very impactful. So I, the only thing I, I tell my residents is because, you know, just try and publish as soon as you can. We have to try and get it out there because yeah. somebody else is going to have the same idea. There's only a limited number of ideas as far as I'm concerned, you know. Yeah. So yeah, I would, even if it is published, even if somebody else publishes it, I think mo in most cases you can still publish it. And by the time you're presenting at a meeting, the data should, theoretically has already been collected, you can write the manuscript and have it ready. You can even submit it, you know, before you've presented at a meeting, as long as you don't think it's going to get, you know, published before then. You just, I always try and avoid getting it actually published before I've had a chance to present it at a meeting or two. Not that you have to, 
you don't have to present at meetings. I just, you know, enjoy doing that. Um, let's see. So I think the question, that next question was, if you have, I think if I'm reading, if you have a, if like you've done a power analysis and it says you need a certain sample size, can you get more than that? Uh, you can always collect more data than you need, but it depends on the risk of the project. For example, if it's a, you know, a randomized controlled trial with like a placebo and where there's risk, there's potential for patient harm, you don't want to collect, you don't want to enroll more patients than you need to enroll because it's just putting extra patients at risk without helping you essentially. But if it's uh, you know a data without harm, you can always collect more data than you necessarily need to have, just adds extra statistical power to your conclusions. So I think it depends on your project. I'm not sure, if, I think I read that correctly. Um, there's, a, there's another question too. It says, how do you choose a journal or what do you base on to decide which journal is likely to accept your work? Some tricks. Yeah. So um, I think, you know, I always try and submit it to, it's sort of trial and error in the end. I mean, um, I would look at the impact factor and try and submit it to a journal with a higher impact factor. If they reject it, then you kind of jump it down to a little bit of a lower impact factor, kind of continue to move your way down until you get hit, hit a journal that it gets accepted to. That's sort of my personal uh, um, technique. Once you've done it a few times, like for example, I've submitted several articles to the Journal of Urology, most get rejected. Um, and so you can kind of get an idea of the types of things a journal might be looking for. And if you don't, if your project doesn't meet those things, then you don't necessarily even have to submit to those um, you know, maybe higher impact factor journals. Um, so it's, for me anyways, it's a lot of trial and error. Most journals are pretty quick. Most high impact factor journals are pretty quick. So you're not going to waste a lot of time, say, if you want to submit to a journal of urology or European urology or any of those types of high impact factor journals. If it's going to get rejected, it'll happen quickly and you can move on to another journal. So it, you don't waste a lot of time that way, maybe a couple of months at most. Other questions? There's a hand. I don't know if, what that means. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> I was waiting for a chance to speak. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jack, for the presentation. I have two questions. First, you talked about doing early literature search and uh, uh, more, more detailed than a Google search. And I don't get the difference. Really, I've done a lot of literature search based on Google, does it mean you have to get the, to the authentic uh, websites where you have a subscription and all that? I think I was mainly just using Google as a shorthand for meaning, you know, a quick five minute uh, search of the internet, not so much, um, you know, not specific to your search engine. I mean, Google is fine or Google Scholar, I suppose. I personally haven't found Google Scholar to be that helpful for me. I, I uh, you know, prefer just to use PubMed um, or Medline for my, you know, um, literature searches. But I think I was just using it, Google in the, you know, in the shorthand sense as opposed to actually meaning Google. But um, yeah, so I just mean do a fairly thorough, I think it's helpful to do a thorough literature search so you have some idea of what's been published on whatever topic you're, you're researching and sort of how those if there are things published, how they've been, um, you know, how that research has been done and sort of, you know, how they might have discussed it. So it just, it's helpful to frame your project. And it, if you don't do it up front, you risk wasting a lot of your time and energy on something that you might not even need to do because it's already been done multiple times, for example. My, my second question is, uh, uh, recently I've been doing a project just uh, epidemiological study on scotopane. I wanted to use uh, retrospective data, but then I realized somewhere in the way that uh, I need to get the outcome from, uh, from the patients 
the patient's own words. And then I don't have consent for that. And I don't want to be calling patients just to ask their outcome after we treated them for scotal pain. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking of how to solve that. Either I do only the retrospective study, depending on what our database has, and, and just bear with the limitations, or I have to call patients, maybe compensate their transport, just to assess did our treatment work for their scrotal pain? Uh, how do you think that yeah. could be best handled? So there's two ways you could solve that problem. The, the sort of the proper way to do it would be, you could, you know, you could ask for an IRB approval for both a retrospective and a prospective sort of part of that project. So, you know, you could retro say you're going to retrospectively look at these patients that you've already seen. And then you could say from here on out, and if I have to contact them again in the future or whatever, that'll be a, I'm going to prospectively collect these data points and we'll consent those patients that were, um, you know, enrolling in this study prospectively. So you can both look back at what you've already done and then also consent patients that you're then going to call or see again in the future. So that's the way you probably should do it. In reality, the way it's um, done a lot of times is just if in your routine practice, you were going to call them anyways to see how they're doing and etc. And then that's documented in the medical record. And then you go and submit a retrospective IRB. You're not calling them. You've already been, they've already been called and the, the data is already in the record. So um, that's another way that people do that sort of thing. But if you want to do it the, you know, the above board way, the honest way would be to really to submit uh, IRB as a prospective trial and then just consent them when you call them. Should be able to do like a verbal consent over the phone or something like that. That depends on your, um, you know, your local IRB. Okay. Um, thank you. That, that, that probably that's all. Maybe, maybe one other question. I, we, uh, do you sometimes have a project with no particular clinical question in mind, but you 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 consent patients for use of their data in case in the future a project comes up like a database you collect patients data and then you consent them to for them to allow you use their data even if there's yeah. no current i think you i don't i think you'd be hard depending on your local institution you'd be hard pressed to have an irb give you approval just to collect random data points without a question in mind um most people are going to want a question that you're trying to answer. I would say what might be more common is you have a question for a prospective trial, you collect the data for that, and you but you also may collect more data that might not specifically answer that exact question, but it's sort of wrapped into the same project. And then you could use that other data that you maybe didn't know how you might need to use it initially, but now you've got another idea and you can use that data you've already collected. So you could kind of do it like that, but at least in my institution, I would never get approval just to sort of consent patients and collect data for no particular reason other than I might need to use it in the future. Um, not in my experience anyways. Okay, thank you for that. Any other questions? I think, if somebody's talking, they're okay, great. Um, we. Oh, okay. I see some. I see a mouth moving, but no words. <laughs> sorry, I was on mute. Sorry. No problem. Uh, do we have to cite uh, which software do we did we use for referencing, or we don't have to cite it? Um, wait. Say, ask that one more time. Do you have to? To, to cite in the uh, manuscript or in the research, which uh, software we used for oh. referencing? No, no, uh -uh. no, you, uh, if, usually people will, um, you know, in terms of software, some, pe some people will, dis will list which statistical software they used for the analysis of their project, but you don't have to, like if, if I hear you correctly, you don't have to list like that you used EndNote for your references or something like that. That doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So is the 
Mendeley accepted. Mendeley software release financing. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that specific one, but it if it's it, you know if it's a sort of a reference manager type software, it should be fine. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. You want to make sure whichever one you use. I mean, in order for for time saving, that you can search the journal you're going to submit it to. So like, I I use EndNote, so that's just the one I know. But um, so you know, if I'm going to submit to European Urology. I'll pull up that software and I'll load the European urology format into it. And it sort of just automatically formats my paper for me. So whichever one you're using, it's helpful to be able to, um, uh, to make sure that it can load sort of quickly the different journals and then reformat your, your reference section accordingly. That's the, you know, that's how it saves you time. And then somebody had just asked, you know, what is EndNote? Because I keep saying it. EndNote is just a software program that is available for for um, references, like a reference manager. So you'll um, what you do for this one or other similar programs, you search for the article, usually by PubMed ID or just the um, article title. Um, it'll search, you know, PubMed for you. It'll pull the the reference into their software program. And then if you're using like Microsoft Word or some other um, word processor to write your manuscript, you then just, for example, like click a button in your reference manager and it'll cite that spot, that spot in your paper. And then at the bottom of the paper automatically list the reference for you. Um, so it's just a quick way to get the references in there without a bunch of typing on your end. So it's just a time saver, not mandatory, but it'll save you hours in the end. Any other questions? All right, good. Well, great. Well, thank you so much for this great lecture. Um, we will have this uh, lecture up on our website. Um, and so if anybody wants to reference it or send it to a colleague who wasn't able to make it today, it'll be available for viewing um, probably in, in the next day or so. But. Um, we appreciate it. And if anybody has questions, you can also, you know, email IBU and we can pass them along. Um, but um, this was this was a great. I'll time. reply to that email string with the PowerPoint attached. Hopefully it's not, I don't think it's too big of a file. So everyone will have access to it. Great. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. And we look Thanks forward so to seeing you guys at our next lecture. All right. Bye. Okay. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm.